Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar and um, brought to you by the Australian College of Nursing, supported by Arjo Huntley. Um, so you may have tried to log in previously, so I'd like to apologise if you were unable to log in. Uh, we did have some technical errors, but hopefully you've managed to log in this time around. Um, this presentation um, will um, hopefully increase your knowledge whether you work in a community setting, an aged care setting um, or the acute hospital setting. Um, I'm just hiding my camera so just bear with me one second. So, and this webinar was brought to everyone on World, World Thrombosis Day which was October the 13th. So the title of this webinar is Stop for Clots, Who Should We Protect? Now my name is Nicola Jackson, I'm your host. I work as a clinical nurse consultant for venous thromboembolism at St Vincent's Public Hospital. If you have any questions for me um, at the end of this presentation, you can email me on the um, email address below. So during this presentation, I will be putting some questions to you. So this is a poll, a voting poll. Uh, so please answer if you can. If you're in a room setting, then a facilitator can vote on your behalf. At the end of this presentation, um, you can post some questions online. You'll see in your menu panel, there is a box where you can type questions. Those questions will be answered at the very end, but please feel free, free to put those questions in as we go along. So, World Thrombosis Day, as I explained, was on October the 13th. Now, this is a very important day because this was Professor Virchow's birthday. So, Professor Virchow died over 100 years ago. Um, it's no longer his birthday, but we'll say happy belated birthday, Professor Burkow. So the objectives of today's session are what is venous thromboembolism, or VTE. We're going to look at identifying patients at risk of VTE. We will understand the types and uses of prophylaxis. We will understand the symptoms and management of VTE as well as look at all the available resources that are out there for you. So why do we care about venous thromboembolism? Well, we know that it's the leading cause of death worldwide. It is the most commonest cause of preventable deaths in hospitals. And in the Western world, somebody dies every 16 seconds from VTE. In Australia, the incidence is roughly around 15,000 cases of BT per year. In 2008, the, uh, Deloitte did a study and found that 56% of those 15,000 are related to pulmonary embolism, 44% are related to deep vein thrombosis, and of all the age groups, 43% of patients were of working age. With an inpatient hospital cost of $81.2 million per year. And every year in Australia, there's roughly around 5,000 deaths per year, although this figure could be a lot higher because often we don't do autopsies on patients anymore. So we don't really know um, the total. So the burden of disease, so VTE actually causes more deaths than all road traffic accidents and falls combined. More people die of VTE than bowel or breast cancer and VTE is 40 times more deadlier than AIDS. Also VTE accounts for 7% of all hospital deaths. You can see from the graph below, that VTE is the fifth commonest cause amongst all the leading causes of death with coronary heart disease number one. Okay, so I'm going to pose a question to you. 
So we'll open the polls. <clears throat> and the first question is, BTE is a, the term for what type of condition? So you'll see the answers. So A is pulmonary hypertension and post thrombotic syndrome. I'm just getting the answers because they're not on my screen. Um, we have ventricular tachycardia, deep vein thrombosis, and pulmonary embolism, or vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Sorry, I said that wrong. Enterococcus, I think. Okay, so we'll just give you a few seconds to answer this question. So I'm hoping you all know why you're listening to this webinar. So this is just a question so that I can make sure you're logged into the right one. <clears throat> okay, so I think we'll close the poll and I'll have to wait a few seconds just to get my answers on the screen. So we have 98% said C, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism. And we had 2% that said A, which is very close to the mark. So pulmonary hypertension can be a, a long-term complication of PE um, and also post-thrombotic syndrome. That can be a long-term complication of DVT. But when we talk about VTE, we're talking about venous thromboembolism. So that includes both deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Okay, so moving on. So VTE, as I explained, comprises both deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So VTE is one of the most common and preventable complications of hospitalization. And the rate of hospital acquired VTE is around 10 to 40% after general surgery and 40 to 60% after hip surgery. If we look at the DVT rates after surgery, trauma, and in some medical groups in the absence of prophylaxis, we can see that patients that have orthopedic surgery, such as total hip arthroplasty, are at 51% risk of acquiring a DVT. We also know that ischemic stroke patients sit within this high bracket, uh, and multiple trauma, again, is 50%. So spinal cord injury patients, they're at about 35% risk, general surgery 25% and neurosurgery gynecology malignancy 22% so I haven't got my teeth in today now if we look at the venous system and circulation you can see on the left hand side of your screen these are the veins of the legs now the veins of the legs comprises two systems one is superficial veins and the superficial veins are the small saphenous vein and the great saphenous vein. The superficial veins sit closer to the skin. They also have these perforating veins, which are bridges, which connect to the deep veins. And some of the deep veins you may have heard of are the tibial veins, the popliteal vein, the femoral vein, and the common femoral vein. One of the confusing things, um, what they used to call the femoral vein, or part of it, was the superficial femoral vein. The femoral vein is not superficial. So if you see the word superficial written before femoral, please disregard it as a superficial vein. Within these veins, we have valves, and these prevent the backflow and pooling of blood. And the way valves work are when the muscle contracts in the um, calves or anywhere, the valves will close like two doors, preventing the blood from pooling. So these will open to allow the blood to return back to the heart. 
Once the blood has left the lower limbs, it then travels and goes into the right um, iliac veins, and then it goes up into the inferior vena cava. From the inferior vena cava, it then goes into the um, cardiac circulation via the right atrium and the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, the blood then passes through the pulmonary artery into the lungs. Now, the pulmonary artery is the only blood vessel in the body that carries deoxygenated blood. So what is DVT? Well, a deep vein thrombosis occurs when a blood clot forms inside a deep vein. The blood clot can break off and travel to the lungs. 60% of patients will develop long-term complications, and this is called post-thrombotic syndrome. So post-thrombotic syndrome is when the valves in the veins are damaged. So the blood pools into the lower limbs which causes venous insufficiency and can lead to things like venous leg ulcers. People with post-thrombotic syndrome, 10% of those will have disabling symptoms and 4% will develop venous leg ulcers. A PE is a blockage of the pulmonary artery which is caused by thrombus in the calf veins. So we know that 90% of DVTs, or sorry, 90% of PEs actually arise from a DVT. Most patients have a silent PE with no symptoms, and these can develop in 40 to 50% of individuals with DVT. There is a 30% mortality rate in patients with PE if left untreated. And PE can cause pulmonary infarct, right ventricular failure, and pulmonary hypertension. And 40% of patients with a DVT have a PE. So we looked at the lower limb veins. So a blood clot usually forms behind the valve of a vein, and this is generally because of blood slowing down and other factors. So you can see there's a deep vein thrombosis, which has formed in a vein. Now, um, deep vein thrombosis that is below knee, we call this a distal deep vein thrombosis. And if the blood clot forms above the knee, we call this a proximal deep vein thrombosis. Proximal DVTs generally are the ones that put the patient at higher, higher risk for pulmonary embolism. And as you can see from the diagram on the right, the blood clot will follow the direction of blood flow. So it enters the heart, leaving through the right ventricle. And once it reaches the lungs, it can splinter off into lots of little clots but usually lodge at the bifurcation of vessels. If the blood clots block vessels then this can lead to damage or ischemia um, as you can see in the um, illustration. Some of the signs and symptoms of DBT and PE. So deep vein thrombosis is often described described as cr a cramping type pain or a lot of my patients explain it's like having a pulled muscle. Patients often get swelling which is usually unilateral although it is known for patients to have bilateral DVTs but this is often linked to malignancy. You will notice that the patient's skin will be quite warm to touch and it will be red and discolored and you may also get venous dilatation of the superficial veins. So the superficial veins will actually come to the surface, as you can see in the picture to the right. Pulmonary embolism. So we'll see shortness of breath. We'll see pleuritic chest pain. Often you'll see a desaturation in your patients with an associated tachycardia. Patients usually have a rest rate above 20 
And some patients develop hemoptysis, especially if they have pulmonary infarction. So the picture on the right, these are actually blood clots that have been removed from somebody's lungs. So when we think of a blood clot, we often think of something very small and almost insignificant. But these are blood that's coagulated along the whole inner of the patient's lung arteries. Remember, deep vein thrombosis is life-threatening and preventable. And as you saw with the last picture, this picture here is a blood clot that developed in a patient. So deep vein thrombosis, which is from ankle to groin, so a significant clot. And in this case, they've done a thrombectomy, removed the clot and actually laid it out where the clot was in the patient's veins. So, and these clots are not actually that uncommon. And this is what can happen if we don't give our patients the right preventative measures. Okay, so question two. So you'll now see the next questions on your screen. So, and we're going to look at which of the following most increases an individual's risk of BTE. And I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer this one. So we have ischemic stroke, um, we have diabetes, knee arthroscopy and air travel. If you were listening carefully to my previous presentation, I think I've already given the answer away. I will just give you a few more seconds. Okay, and we'll close the poll. So I'll just wait a few seconds for the answers to come in. And then I'll go through the answers with you. So it's surprising how many um, of people from the general public think that um, airplane flying is the highest risk. It actually isn't the highest risk. So by flying on a long haul flight, you put yourself at around four times the risk. For patients that come into hospital, their risk is around 100 times. So this is why it's very important that we prevent blood clots in our hospitalised patients. Okay, so for this one, we had a ischemic stroke, and that was the most answers, and that one is correct. So we had 8% with diabetes. There has been some studies that show there could be some link there, but we don't actually identify it as an individual risk factor. So knee arthroscopy. So for this question, um, again, this has been quite a high response rate of 39%. Now we know that patients that have knee replacement surgery, so knee arthroplasty, they're at high risk, but knee arthroscopy, that's generally a day procedure. Um, so it doesn't require a long hospitalised stay. So if somebody doesn't have any additional risk factors, then this would be fairly low. So, and then 10% air travel. So that's quite good that most of you don't believe that air travel is that much of a higher risk. Okay, so let's go back to Professor Verkow. So who was Professor Birkow? Well, he was seen as the founding father of pathology and social medicine. He was born in Poland in 1821 and died in Prussia in 1902. So he held five consecutive positions and worked tirelessly till his death. And he has 2,000 publications to his name. 
on the screen you can see some of the terms that you've obviously come across before, such as leukemia. Um, these terms are all terms coined by Professor Burkow. And he was the one that really came up with the cellular theory that we all learn in um, nursing school. So the most important thing that he developed, or the theory he developed, was Burkow's triad. And some of you may have heard of Burkow's triad before. So Burkow's triad is a theory that blood clots are caused by three um, factors. The first factor is hypercoagulability. So this is when the blood's thick or stickier and under hypercoagulability comes conditions such as cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, estrogen use, thrombophilia, sepsis and dehydration. So this one's for Shannon because I told her I would have a drink when the word dehydration came up. So that's an in-house joke. So the next factor is endothelial injury. And within endothelial injury, you have things such as surgery, prior VTE, venous access devices, vasculitis, trauma, and surgery of the lower extremity, hip, abdomen, or pelvis. An endothelial injury is the damage of the inner lining of a blood vessel. Now, this doesn't have to be caused by trauma. This can actually be caused by venous dilatation with things such as anesthesia. And when the veins dilate, you often get some small tears in the inner lining. Once you get the tears, you have collagen that's exposed. And platelets, as we know, platelets help the blood to clot. Platelets love collagen and will stick to it like bees to honey. The third thing we have is venous stasis. And this includes immobility, age, heart and lung disease, obesity, stroke, and spinal cord injury. Patients who reach the age of 40 and above are at risk. That risk actually increases when the patients reach the age of 60. Now let's use Professor Verkow as our case study. Um, and I just want you to have a think about this question. So Professor Verkow was 80 years old. Um, so um, we don't know of any past medical history. Now he actually suffered a fractured hip after falling from a streetcar. But because we don't have streetcars anymore, we'll say that he fell from a bus. So just have to think about what his risk factors are. And then we'll go through the answers together. Okay, so you may have come up with trauma immobility, dehydration, age, and maybe sepsis given his age, and being hospitalized, etc. Sorry. So if we look at these risk factors around this case study, so we had immobility as one. So this fits directly under venous stasis. And venous stasis, as you know, is when patient's blood slows down. And this is usually because the calf muscle pump is no longer active for some reason. So we also have age. So as I explained before, patients over the age of 60 are at increased risk of BTE. Dehydration. So this can make the blood um, thicker and it can also lead to the blood slowing down and we have trauma so we know that he sustained a hip fracture which is a trauma um, and also patients that have um, like I said previously orthopedic 
surgery or injury, but generally at increased risk because of the distortion to the pelvic veins. And sepsis. So again, sepsis can make patients' blood thicker or stickier. So this indeed puts Professor Verkow at high risk of developing a VTE. And he actually died nine months after his hip fracture, back in the days when we didn't know about preventative measures. So I often wonder if he actually became a product or his death was a product of his own theory. Okay, next question for you guys. So, which of the following patients should receive extended chemical prophylaxis? And when I say extended chemical prophylaxis, I mean which patients should go home on prophylaxis? So we'll give you a few more seconds. And this one often causes quite a lot of debate. Um, I know that some doctors are quite resistant to sending patients home on anticoagulants. So we do actually send um, orthopedic patients home, um, hip fractures, generally get 35 days of prophylaxis. So we'll close that poll and then we'll go through some of the other indications. Okay. So I hope you've all had time to answer. And um, so a lot of you are answering A, so which is ischemic stroke. Um, B was major surgery. C, major abdominal cancer surgery. 20% um, of you voted for that one and 19% all surgical patients. So the answer there is actually major abdominal cancer surgery. And these patients often need 28 days of prophylaxis. So you've got the factors not only of um, surgery, abdominal surgery, which um, disrupts the pelvic veins, but you've also got cancer. And we know that cancer increases individuals' risk. And it's been quoted as anywhere from 5% up as high as 7 um, seven times the risk, not percent. Um, ischemic stroke, so ischemic stroke generally um, once their risk factors diminish, they don't need further prophylaxis. Um, and major surgery, so generally again once their risk subsides, they don't need extended prophylaxis. But definitely patients with cancer and surgery do need extended prophylaxis. Okay, so when we look at the prevention of VTE, there are two types of thromboprophylaxis. So one is chemical, um, and we know this as um, medications. So Chemical prophylaxis doesn't dissolve blood clots, but it prevents the formation of venous thrombus. And it also prevents the extension of thrombus by altering the process of blood coagulation. And mechanical prophylaxis. So mechanical both includes compression stockings and calf compressors. So compression stockings, we actually now term those as graduated compression stockings or GCS. Um, my background as well as vascular is neuro. Um, so when I came across the terminology GCS, it used to confuse the hell out of me. If you feel com comfortable just calling them um, compression stockings or 
difficulties from robotic stockings, then that's fine. Um, but if you read the literature, you will see the term graduated compression stockings. Um, Carve compressors, as I like to call them, the official term is intermittent pneumatic compression, which is a bit of a mouthful, or IPC for short. Um, and these act, as you know, by or you may not know, um, by increasing blood flow velocity in the leg veins. So when we look at different forms of prophylaxis, so from earlier we learned that hip fracture surgery or arthroplasty is a higher risk. Um, and patients often need either a um, low molecular weight heparin, such as a noxaparin, or those patients can now receive one of the newer or novel oral anticoagulants. Hip fracture surgery patients also can have either graduated compression stockings or intermittent pneumatic compression, or both if they're very immobile. So there are no studies to say that compression stockings and calf compressors together will decrease the DVT risk even more. But what I like to do in my hospital is use both types, and that's because if the patients are get out of bed, then usually the IPC are taken off. They don't always get put on immediately. If the patients have stockings underneath, it will give them some protection. And you can see the duration. So hip fracture surgery, 35 days, knee arthroplasty, 14 days, major trauma, five to 10. Major abdominal cancer surgery is 28 days. So, and these guidelines actually, instead of twice daily unfractionated heparin, these patients should either receive anoxaparin as a daily or unfractionated heparin. But the recommended dose is up to three times a day for this high risk group. Acute spinal cord injury and moderate to major, major surgery should be on prophylaxis of five to 10 days. So and in medical patients, ischemic stroke, the recommendation is, 40, um, is low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin, although noxaparin actually decreases the bleeding risk. With ischemic stroke patients, it's also very important um, to rule out um, hemorrhagic transformation, which some stroke patients are at risk of. So really, these recommended guidelines are for those patients that don't have additional contraindications. Myocardial infarction or heart failure is another risk, as is general medical patients and cancer patients. So historically, there's been um, a misconception that surgical patients are at increased risk than medical patients. The risk is in fact 50-50. As you can see, we do actually have a lot of medical patients that are at high risk. So it's not always surgery that increases that risk. You'll see some um, guidelines around if you look into um, venous thromboembolism. And we do have some Australian guidelines. So this one comes from the National Health and Medical Research Council. So, and as you can see, I've zoomed into the um, total hip and knee replacement one. And there are quite a number of options for prophylaxis out there. So you really do need to look at your own guidelines to see which um, types of prophylaxis your patients should receive. So this is another Australian guideline, and this is the Australian New Zealand Working Party on the Management and Prevention of BTE. Um, and there's been two editions. The fifth edition, I believe, was published in 2010. 
Unfortunately, there's no other international guidelines around and there's nothing to my knowledge that is being published. Now, the, um, the evidence has been little changed to the evidence. Um, and I know that the last international guidelines were published by the American uh, chest physicians uh, in 2012. So, and that's quite a comprehensive document that lists all the available evidence and resources. As far as chemical prophylaxis, so we have low molecular weight heparin. Um, now, one of the good things about low molecular weight heparin is it's often a daily injection as opposed to two, three times a day. Now, people do have to be a little bit cautious in patients with renal impairments, in particular elderly patients. And what we look at as far as renal function is an eGFR or creatinine clearance. So either one of these should be above 30. And if a patient has an eGFR of below 30, then they often have a reduced dose of low molecular weight heparin. So um, low molecular weight heparin, also the patient maybe needs to self-administer on a long-term basis for extended duration. Low and um, unfractionated heparin, so the dose is usually 5,000 units two or three times a day. This one is often preferred for patients that are at risk of bleeding because it's short acting. Also, no dose adjustment is needed in those patients with renal impairment. Although, as I said previously, the patients need um, two or three injections a day. Some of the newer drugs you may have heard of, rivaroxaban, apixaban, dibigatran, these are only recommended in hip or knee surgical patients. Again, the physician needs to be, or a surgeon needs to be careful about the patient's kidneys and an EGFR needs to be above 30. There is no antidote either with these medications, although in May of 2016, the TGA actually approved an antidote for dibigotran. And this is the first antidote that's been on the market. Aspirin and warfarin are both controversial. So aspirin is an antiplatelet medication, and we know that blood clots in arteries are made up mainly of platelets. Therefore, aspirin is only effective on arteries with some effect on veins. Warfarin, on the other hand, is a very good anticoagulant, but it's very difficult to manage. The patients need lots of blood tests, and there's a delay on warfarin levels getting up to above two. Now, if we look at the effects on the coagulation cascade, um, so you may have seen the clotting cascade. There's two arms of the cascade. One is the intrinsic arm and one is the extrinsic. Intrinsic is blood components and extrinsic is the damage that's being done to tissue. And the coloured uh, flags you can see tell you where these anticoagulants actually affect the clotting cascade. So vitamin K antagonists, which is warfarin, they target a number of factors. And this is why it takes so long for warfarin to have full effects. Also, the way warfarin works, it can make some patients actually um, be more coagulable. So give them an increased risk of clotting. This is why patients often need bridging or they need something um, to thin the blood until the warfarin kicks in. Direct factor 10A inhibitors. Um, so you'll see there's a number of these. Now the clue is in the 10A. 
So if you think about the drugs such as anoxaparin, rivaroxaban, dibiga, not dibigatran, um, apexaban, you'll notice that actually all those medicines contain the letters XA. So we know by that that this directly targets factor 10A. So, and also low molecular weight heparin, which is anoxaparin, which is 10A. And um, the only different one is dibigatran, which acts on uh, factor 2A. So, when we give patients blood thinners, we also need to be aware of those at bleeding risk. Things that increase patients' risk of bleeding include significant renal impairment, active major bleeding, chronic clinically significant measurable bleeding over 48 hours, inherited bleeding disorders or haemophilias, severe platelet function or disorder, um, and often when pla patients have a platelet count below 50, we class that as thrombocytopenia. Patients with platelets under 50 should not be given anticoagulation unless it's under the direction of a haematologist. We also have patients that have had recent CNS bleeding, um, major surgery or high bleeding of high bleeding risk, active peptic ulcer or active ulcerative GI disease, liver failure, concomitant use of medications, and neuroaxial blocks or lumbar punctures. So what we need to monitor in our patients, we obviously need to assess the bleeding if a patient's on an anticoagulant. We need to monitor patients' platelets. And if we notice that the patient's platelets are decreasing between 30 to 50% in 24 hours, this could indicate that the patient is developing antibodies or a reaction to heparin. And we call this heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. Patients renal function, so most patients have an EGFR above 90, but again, if it's getting down to 30 or below, then you need to alert someone. Um, hemoglobin, so often we see patients with a low hemoglobin, but that might be their normal. If a patient's hemoglobin is trending down, again, somebody should be alerted. And most people forget about injection sites. So injection sites definitely need monitoring because patients can develop skin lesions, nodules, and infections. Okay, next question for you, so I can have a little rest. So we'll open the poll to question number four. <clears throat> so, and now we're looking at what is the contra, one of the contraindications of graduated compression stockings. So our patients with a previous history of BTE, um, are stockings contraindicated in those patients or patients with varicose veins, um, severe peripheral arterial disease, or superficial thrombophlebitis. And this will lead us on to our next sec section of this presentation. So I'll go through some of the mechanical methods of prophylaxis with you. Okay, so I think we've finished now. So let's close the poll and then I'll get the answers to you. Okay, so Contraindications of um, graduated compression stockings. So the main contraindication is severe peripheral arterial disease. So arteries supply blood to the lower limbs. 
Um, and if there is some narrowing to arteries, we don't actually want to put compression on because that will narrow the arteries more and then there may be a blockage in blood flow to the limb. But as you know, veins actually take blood away from the limb up to the heart. So if the veins aren't working very well, we actually need to add some compression to try and close those valves together to stop the blood from pooling. So 0% said previous history of BTE is a um, contraindication, which is good. And we actually, <clears throat> up until recently, we actually treated patients with DBT with compression stockings. And that was to prevent post-thrombotic syndrome. So B, varicose veins. The varicose veins isn't a contraindication because we need to help the veins return blood. And 85% are correct in saying peripheral arterial disease and 9% superficial thrombophlebitis. So superficial thrombophlebitis is a small clot in the superficial veins. Um, and we can put compression stockings on those patients. Okay, so how do graduated compression stockings work? Well, they provide graduated compression from the ankle increasing up. Um, so higher pressures are at the ankle, and then the pressures get lower and lower, and this promotes venous returns. This, in fact, reduces the diameter of the vein, which prevents the venous distension and prevents those endothelial tears from occurring. So some of the um, <clears throat> guidelines or recommendations are that stocking should um, meet the or follow the Siegel pressure profiles. And what we're looking for is around 18% um, millimetres of mercury pressure at the ankle. Um, GCS should only really be used on patients with prolonged periods of immobility. And skin inspections must be carried out regularly on these patients. Otherwise, they can develop things like heel pressure ulcers, um, often I see patients with indentations in their skin and this is usually because limbs have swollen and patients don't often get measured correctly or often enough. So and there was a study which was called the CLOT study um, and this showed that there was more compli complications with applying GCS on stroke patients. So within, with stroke patients, we now recommend the use of IPC. And stockings can produce reverse gradients if, not correctly, if they're not correctly fitted or sized properly. And this was found in 66% of patients. Intermittent pneumatic compression. So this works by an inflatable garment um, and you'll find either single chamber garments, which is uniform compression, or multi-chamber, which is sequential pressure. And these both work by emptying the veins to increase blood flow velocity. There are some machines on the market to offer both uniform and sequential pressures. There is no difference as far as clinical outcomes as to which type of compression is used. So the type of compression really is down to patient comfort and to clinical preference. So a safe and effective alternative to anticoagulation is intermittent pneumatic compression. And a lot of the guidelines state that if you can't use chemical prophylaxis, then you should use IPC on patients. IPC can also help lower limb edema in um, in mobile patients. Oops, sorry, gone over my slides. And IPC mimic the natural activity of the calf muscle. They flush for valve pockets. They also have been shown to apply, apply a shearing strain on the, on the endothelial lining of veins and arteries, which enhances clot degradation platelet disaggregation and enhances vasodilation. 
And we know that IPC decreases the risk of DVT by about 60%. When we look at mechanical prophylaxis and Birkow's triad, IPC addresses all three factors. They prevent venous stasis by applying external compression, which pushes the blood from the superficial veins into the deep veins. And IPC also uh, reduces venous distension and decreases or increases blood flow velocity which in turn prevents hypercoagulability. When we look at intermittent compression, pneumatic compression or calf compressors, uh, the American College of Chest Physicians recommend that these should be worn for about 75% of the time, which amounts to about 18 hours per day. So if your patients are going to have the full benefits of IPC, they really should be reapplied after showers or activities um, and kept on for as long as possible. The ACCP also recommend that the devices should have a compliance monitor or a time log so that you can actually work out how many hours the patients have worn those devices. Devices should be battery operated um, so the patient can continue therapy when they go off their ward for tests. And really the success of therapy is dependent on patient compliance, comfort and nursing intervention. So we looked at some contraindications earlier. So to recognize patients with peripheral arterial disease, you need to check for pulses in their feet, check for capillary return, um, and if you notice in the notes it's documented that they have peripheral arterial disease, then you shouldn't be applying compression unless you seek expert advice. Some other contraindications include peripheral neuropathy, lower limb wounds, recent limb surgery, patients at high risk of developing skin tears and cardiac failure. So if we look at Professor Verkow, so he was admitted to hospital after that nasty fall um, and underwent insertion of a dynamic hip screw. He's covering well day one post-op. His EGFR is 65, platelets 256, and HB 106. So what do you think his recommended prophylaxis regime is? So you may be worried about his HB, but he's actually come back from theater. So he may have lost some blood in theater, so that shouldn't preclude him from receiving prophylaxis. Also, what duration of prophylaxis should he be given? And we've gone through the duration earlier. So the prophylaxis regime can be a low molecular weight heparin, and it should be either GCS and or IPC. But don't forget the most simple effective measures to reduce VTE is early ambulation and hydration. And the patient should be on preventative measures for a minimum of 35 days. Some of the investigations for VTE that you may have come across are ultrasound, venography, CTPA. Ultrasound scanning is the gold standard for DVT, as is venography. Um, but venography is actually Sorry, venography is a gold standard, not ultrasound. But venography is invasive. So we don't do that anymore. We tend to use ultrasound scans. And CTPA or VQ is gold standard for pulmonary embolism. Um, some patients are given an ECG or a TT to look for signs of right heart strain. And you can see here some of the treatment types for a first event. So we use various forms of anticoagulation. Um, IV heparin is often used in high-risk bleeding patients 
or patients that have renal impairment. We also use some of the new oral anticoagulants. An IVC filter is not treatment in itself, but for those who cannot have anticoagulation, we sometimes place an IVC filter, especially for patients with proximal DVT with high risk. Most patients will have three to six months of anticoagulation for a DVT. It can be longer than that if the patient's risk uh, carries on. IVC filters should not be left in for longer than a year, although you can leave them in lifelong. But if the patient's risk actually subsides, they really need to be taken out because they can lead to complications. And if you don't know what an IVC filter is, it looks like the um, spokes of an umbrella with little fish hooks at the end. And this is put into the inferior vena cava, just below the heart. And it opens out so that any blood clots that are traveling to the lungs can actually be caught in this basket type device. Some of the complications are filters that move, um, some of the arms can break off. So this is why we tend to not keep them in long term if we don't need to. And some patients are given clot busting drugs, although this can be quite dangerous, especially in those patients that have got a high bleeding risk, because you're basically dissolving clots everywhere in the body and thinning the blood down to such an extent that they're at high risk of bleeding. Okay, so if you've not put a question down for me, then we've got a few minutes at the end. So type away and I'll just go through the summation. So DVT and PE constitute major health problems. They can be significantly reduced and we know which prophylactic regimes to use now. And in some groups of patients, more than one effective prophylactic regimen is available and should be used. And remember, prevention is key. Effective prophylaxis reduces BT incidence by 60 to 90%. So, and if you want further information, I'll leave these websites up on the site for you um, and please look at the uh, Clinical Excellence Commission's website because they've come up with a lot of useful resources for you to use in your day-to-day -day practice. Okay, so does anyone have any questions they'd like to put to me? Okay, so the first question is compression stockings. And how do we know we are achieving a good fit? So if you use compression stockings in your institution, they should always come with a tape measure and a measuring guide. And it's really important to um, go back to the manufacturer's guidelines. So they must be fitted correctly. Um, with some stockings, often you'll see the heel placement. So this is like a square patch in the heel of the stocking, and often the heel needs to go in the middle of the square patch, and that's how you know that they're fitted properly. And when we looked at the veins of the legs, you have the popliteal vein and artery that runs behind the knee. So we definitely do not want compression behind the knee because that could constrict blood flow. So the stockings need to fall a couple of centimetres below the crease of the knee if using below knee. Some people use above knee. Um, so thigh length stockings are actually more effective than knee length, but it's very difficult to get a good fit of stocking in the thigh length. And patients often aren't compliant, therefore knee highs end up being more effective as a result. Okay, we'll have another question. So who should assess VT prior to surgery? So in New South Wales, it's mandatory and it's written into New South Wales health policy, but it's 
it's the admitting medical team who they're the ones that are responsible for risk assessing patients and this may be different in the private sector I think nurses take the lead as far as risk assessment um, but I'm definitely in a public sector doctors are the ones that are responsible for anticoagulation so the person responsible for the high-risk medications need to be responsible for assessment Okay, next question. How soon can you apply IPC or compression stockings post BTE? So that, that's a really good question. We know that with a DVT, the clot can be unstable for the first 48 hours, um, but not necessarily. This is a very tricky question. Um, so in our policy, we have 48 hours until or until an expert has reviewed the patient. So what you might find a patient with a DBT might have a grossly edematous limb. And there has been cases where patients have been risk, at risk of compartment syndrome, where the swelling from the DBT has actually compromised the arterial system. Um, and these patients, you do not want to put compression stockings on. Usually after 48 hours, you know whether that patient's stable and usually the swelling in the limb will reduce. So after 48 hours, you can put the stocking on or seek expert advice. So I think we've got one more time. One, sorry, we've got time for one more question. Uh, I think I've gone just a minute over time. So this is the last one. If you do have any questions which you feel I've not been able to answer, please email me. So, is it common for orthopods to not like Clexane due to an increase in causing leaking wounds? So, there has been some resistance, I believe, as far as Clexane, um, especially in those patients that have got are at risk of developing bleeds into joints. So what I would say is we know that patients can actually die from a PE. So this really has to be the number one thing to consider. Um, Clexane has found to have less of a bleeding risk um, compared to other things. So really it does have to be down to the surgeon. Um, they're the ones that make the decision. But yes, I suppose some doctors are resistant to using low molecular weight heparin. Um, and it's really, the decision has to be on a case-by-case -case basis and looking at the available evidence. Okay, so I'd like to thank you all for joining me today. And again, sorry if you couldn't log in the first time around. So I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. And I'd just like to end this webinar by thanking the Australian College of Nursing and RJ Huntley Gitengi Group for supporting this. And please consider becoming a member of the ACN where you can expand your scope and skills and progress your career. And you can check out their website, which is below. So once again, thank you for joining me and I hope you all have a good day. Bye.